as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. What's going on, guys, and welcome back to another virtual episode of Real Fans Real Talk. I'm your host, Eric Sanchez, a.k.a. Legend in Two Games. As always, the big homie with me, Trip Young. We got a special guest, a good friend to the show, Scoop B, NBA insider on the show. Scoop, what's going on, man? I'm chilling. Always glad to be in the land of the living, glad to be with you guys once again. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure for us to have you on the show. Trip, how are you doing today? I know you guys got a big win, but we're going to keep it all basketball today. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I just want to say, I just want to say this right here. Ever since I've hung this head up, uh, you know, right here behind me where I record at, the Giants have not lost a game, and they are currently in first place uh, in the NFC East. Uh, they stopped, you know, Russell Wilson and the Seattle Seahawks today in a huge uh, victory without uh, Daniel Jones. So I just want to say I'm very proud of my guys. I'm going to keep this here. I'm not going to take that hat down uh, for a little while. And, you know, just to double up on him, I threw, I threw the Giants on again, you know, up here too. Just so the people at home know, you know, what's going on outside, you know? No problem. I, I wanted to give you your moment. I know it was a big win. But, again, we're keeping it all the way basketball. We got Scoop with us tonight. Uh, Scoop, we got to start with the, with the biggest story in the league uh, that came out this past week. Obviously, Russell Westbrook on his way to D.C. for John Wall and a first-round pick. What were you hearing about this trade, and what's the overall reaction from everybody inside the league? Um, well, I mean, the, the Wizards were a team that were, were of interest uh, as, as it relates to what Russell wanted and you know, what the Rockets were able to get for him. Um, ironically, the, 2023, the 2023 pick uh, will actually be a, a, a pick that could come in handy. Um, that is the year that if Bronny James uh, does not, if the, if the uh, collective bargaining agreement changes and you know, players are able to come out of high school once again, it would be something to pay attention to look out for um but but directly to your question about you know russ and and, and as well as uh john wall um number one it pairs a uh, wall uh, with former college teammate uh, demarcus cousins in kentucky once again um and and also really truly um it gives uh it gives um i guess russell a fresh start uh i think when you look at just over the last couple of years um, with the Oklahoma City Thunder, you know, he requested out after you know, Paul George ultimately left and went to the Clippers. Um, it's twice that Russell has been able to dictate or pick which team he wanted to go to. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, Wizards did that for him. He didn't get along with Tillman Fertitta, I'm told. Um, you know, there were some questions just about political allegiance and really just fit overall uh, with that team. Uh, it's possible Harden could still be on his way out, uh, particularly – um, with some of the things that have been said over the last couple of days, just about training camp and, and, and um, you know, but that could be due to the protocol with um, COVID-19. But, you know, the, the Rockets kind of um, over the last few months, um, even during the playoffs, there were some things that were going on, like, you know, over the last couple of years, Mike D'Antoni, former head coach, uh, his, his coaching staff was diminishing more and more and more. Um, they, they took Irv Rowland, um, who was Harden's um, trainer as, and doubled as a, a development coach with the Rockets. They, they got rid of him. Um, and then just over the years, over the last couple of years, things have just changed. Um, and then, you know, ultimately their GM left. Um, and, um, you know, I know that Jeff Van Gundy, uh, as well as uh, uh, Paul Silas, or excuse me, Steven Silas, son of Paul Silas. Silas is now the head coach of the Rockets, his first head coaching position. 
um, those were some of the guys that were in the running. And, uh, you know, there were some things that went on behind the scenes as it related to, you know, the direction and power and all of those things. And uh, ultimately, the Rockets are shelved themselves. And it really kind of goes back to a few years ago uh, during the NBA Finals or when they had a chance to go to the NBA Finals when Chris Paul was the point guard. And they just, you know, the last couple of years, they just keep uh, losing players year by year by year. And, you know, here we are now. Uh, John Wall is the point guard for the Rockets, but, um, you know, Harden could be on his way out still. He requested a trade, and, you know, the Nets are on the top of his list as are the 76ers. The Boston Celtics have inquired. I got to I gotta go back for, for a second, Scoop, because um, you, you, you brought up something, and we've been going through a lot uh, in this country over the past couple of months. We recently just, you know, we got through the election, even though um, the current guy in the office is still trying to uh, contest it. But um, you said there was, there was a little underlining reasoning in, in there of why uh, Westbrook wanted out. And, I, and I, I, I'm from what I've heard, Harden kind of wants out for the same reason, and that's for, uh, for Titter's support of President Trump. Um, yes. Okay. So I, I, all right, I wanted because I know you posted that on your on your IG. So I wanted to get into that a, a little bit. What do you want to know? <laughs> well, well, I, mean, scoop, I need to scoop. How how accurate is that? Like, is is that one of the the main factors and why they both kind of want out of Houston? And before you answer that, scoop really quick, because I want to double down on that because I was I was going to go that same direction. So you you have reported that, and then I've also heard that played into a factor why Daryl Morey requested his release as well. So if you can elaborate on that as well, if you have any inside info on that. I spoke to Daryl a couple of weeks ago. We talked about everything but that. Um, but, you know, as it relates to the Rockets at large. Um, why are you laughing? <laughs> well, I, no, I mean, I, I, we're laughing. I, again, I think Tripp and I both, you know, we laughing about it because, you know, the, the, the story has been circulating. He, he allegedly told Tillman that he wanted time off to spend with his family. And within two weeks, he takes the Sixers job. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I, I can, I can, yeah, I mean, but the thing is with, with Daryl Morey, um, the Daryl Morey thing, it, from just different things I've seen and heard and read, the combination of all those, and the NBA is like a big puzzle. You, you read something, you talk to someone, you kind of fit that piece where it goes, but um, I think this Morey thing kind of goes back to China, and I think that, I think because he took that job in Philadelphia, um, and because COVID happens, I think some people get amnesia. Um, the Rockets underperformed in the playoffs. Uh, and I think if, the, I, from what I have heard, um, Tillman Fertitta had interest in bringing in, at one point, Jeff Van Gundy. And Van Gundy and Maury go back to when Van Gundy was the head coach of the Rockets and years ago when Steve Francis was there and then Grady came in, Yao Ming was there. I think that was going to be an oil and water type of situation. Um, Steven Salas ended up becoming head coach. Um, Maury got a better job as a team president in Philadelphia 76ers. Um, personally, uh, I think Philadelphia got better in the off season by name. They still got to play and produce. But to me, Elton Brand is somebody who I feel like lost, some have said has lost power, you know, and, and I think I, I, I cannot nail that down. I have not spoken to Elton about that. But um, I think that Maury has relationships and has been doing, has been around front office into workings for a longer period of time. To me, Philadelphia would make sense if Philadelphia was looking to bring in Harden because he has the relationship with Harden. The NBA is a relationship business. Now, um, as it relates to the Rockets and the whole political thing, uh, as it relates to President Trump and uh, just his Make, Make America Great uh, movement, I've, I've heard um, that um, there are a lot of people who were turned off in Houston um, by just 
uh, his his public declaration. I mean, I, I was he wearing MAGA know, hats in the locker room? Is that? I don't know that to be true, but I just <laughs> you know he. I know he has he has publicly supported President Trump. Yeah. I know that he's made money. Versus maybe James Dolan, the owner of the Knicks, is a lot more quiet about it. But you know, it's almost like you know I, I grew up in the church. Maybe if you're sitting in the barbershop there are people who don't want to hear you witnessing to them in the barbershop. They want to talk about sports and women. And maybe in that vein, comparatively, it may have been the, t- the same type of situation. So um, with to your question, yeah, I, I, I mean, particularly in this climate, um, there, are, uh, there are players who are turned off by it, but let's not act as if there are not many NBA owners who have donated uh, to uh, President Trump if I'm not mistaken, I know James Dolan has. If I'm not mistaken, I know the Orlando Magic uh, are, are Trump supporters. Tilda Fertitta is a Trump supporter. But I also think that's so layered um, for this reason. I have friends who are Democrats. I have friends who are independents. I have friends who are Republicans. Uh, we can agree to disagree on some things. But sometimes it's not even about the person who's in office. It's about their purse, their wallet, and their bottom line. And while they may not like that person, um, it fits their agenda of how they choose to live their life. Um, so I, I, I think in this case, it's different. I think Tilma Fertitta, just based off of what I've heard, I think it's a situation where um, it's both. I think he supports President Trump, and I think that he fits his bottom line financially. And I think that may have rubbed some people within that organization the wrong way. Plus the combination of the fact that, you know, just over the last few years, there's just been a decaying of, of, of wins and skills and, and more. You know, Chris Paul went on the greener pastures in Oklahoma City and, and dad on near beat the, the, the Rockets in the playoffs. Didn't happen, game seven, I believe, but, you know, the Rockets ended up losing to the Lakers and, you know, the Lakers, you know, played the, the, the Nuggets in the conference finals and the Lakers won the championship, beating the Heat. So it just seems like over the years, I mean, even if you go back to the playoffs, you know, uh, very openly, Mike D'Antoni expressed that he had no interest in returning uh, and resigning uh, with the Houston Rockets. So, you know, that, that, that kind of shows you just where they were as a team morale wise. And, you know, and here we are. I think I answered your question. <laughs> I, I, got, I got another question for you, Scoop. But let me say, let me say this really quick before I ask my question. Um, I want to go back because the reason why I was laughing actually is because people don't want to give you the credit that you deserve. Um, so I just like the fact that you had you light flexed on. Yeah, I was on the phone with Daryl Moore, you know, a couple of times and uh, we, we chopped it up and whatnot. Oh. So, no, because we 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 like to get people their flowers while they're here. So, I, you know, what I'm saying like I, I gotta let people know, like, you, you can't you can't question Scoop, man. Scoop has been doing this for a very long time and he's better than probably a lot of your favorites at, 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 at his job. So, I just want to give you, you know, what I'm saying, give you a little bit of, of props while we got mm-hmm. you on, on the show. Um, my question is, we saw how that situation, you know what I'm saying, worked out with, with Westbrook and Harden. Do you feel like that's going to be a trend, uh, moving forward where players will, will not want to play for owners that, uh, I guess share, a, have a difference in political view? I mean, that's, that's no different than you or I, if we work for a company and we don't agree with the views of your employer. You look for another job. The only difference is these are high profile athletes that are brands outside of the the corporation that is the NBA. Um, I mean, I I think to answer your question, perhaps, I mean, you you look at how outspoken LeBron James has become about everything. Um, You look at Kyrie Irving, uh, who, you know, has was expressive about the the NBA bubble. Um, And then, you know, when that the the shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin happened, everybody said Kyrie was right. You know, so I think when you look at just where we are politically, um, I think the NBA, uh, different than the other major sports where the players often do run uh, the establishment, at least as talent goes, um, you could see it. Um, I think that you're seeing it in New York in a different way with the Knicks where key marquee players don't are not wanting to play here but I think the Knicks is a separate entity because you have seen in real time what happened with Spike Lee you've seen in real time what happened with Charles Oakley 
And then Carmelo Anthony has a lot of these guys as OG. And so I'm sure they go to him and ask questions and yep. there you have it. So it's like it's seen and unseen, this dialogue. Um, you know, I can tell you that, you know, that's why Kyrie Irving ultimately did not sign with the Knicks. That's part of the reason why I won, because he wanted to establish his old identity as a team he grew up watching. And the Nets who were in New Jersey at the time and then, you know, moved to Brooklyn and you can create your own identity. It's like LeBron growing up in Cleveland and seeing Michael Jordan because he's in the Midwest and, you yeah. know, Chicago is the Midwest is New York. But, you know, um, he ultimately did not sign with the Bulls and he went to the, to the Miami Heat and, you know, kind of established an identity with his friends that he came in the league with, with Chris Bosh and uh, Dwayne Wade. So I, I think when you talk about players to your initial question about, you know, just choosing where they want to go and more, um, you know, Kurt Flood gave what's the blueprint as it related to giving players the option through free agency to do what they needed to do. So, you know, I think that, that, that I think that's a carry over to where we are today as a society with athletes. They have a bigger platform in the voice. Yeah. I want to backtrack now, really quickly. Scoop, you highlighted the moves that the Sixers made and, and talk about new head coach um, Doc Rivers. Him going to Philly and he is the only it. It head coach to ever blow power shift there three different brands where he was up 3-1. And his, then we heard the comments from uh, Paul George. Um, at Curtis one point, Philly had all at Sam Hankey about no and the whole trust the process in that series thing. And then they moved on from him and went to the reputation of taking a hit. And they went ultimately an old school mentality of building a team. And now they're back to the analytics part of things. Do you think this is their way of saying they screwed up by moving on too fast from Sam Hankey? And and ultimately, how, how much say-so do you think Daryl Moore really has there in regards to building that roster? Because we know they have two generational stars there. Well, I think Elton did a good job of kind of taking over for Colangelo, Colangelo after a very precarious situation, um, particularly with those burner accounts and just all those things that are going on. I, I can't credit him enough. I think we're... we're Philly kind of got the water kind of got murky was um, Jimmy Butler and JJ Redick walking. Um, and then the Sixers signing Al Horford. I don't have a problem with Al Horford, uh, but I think the Sixers overpaid him. Um, I think that a lot of the reason why Al Horford or rather Jimmy Butler did not return to Philadelphia uh, was because of their head coach, former head coach and Brett Brown. Um, you know, some would argue that, that Brett stayed a little too long and was kind of, had a kind of a, he was, he kind of was like the Jeff Fisher of the NBA. Just Jeff Fisher was with the Titans for a while. Yeah. That's a great, that's well, a great, we talk uh, about that all the time. <laughs> that's a great analogy right there in comparison. Um, I, I personally do like Brett. Um, I spent some time with Brett last season. I was in and out of Philly a lot. Um, and, you know, was in on those Zoom calls with the Sixers last season. And um, I like his basketball mind, um, but I think, I think he stayed too long. And I think the type of player that Brett Brown likes um, is a lot more agreeable than Jimmy Butler is. Okay. Um, off air, I may say that a little differently than I would on air. Um, <laughs> I, I would just say that um, if, if I could use this, I, I think um, Brett Brown does not subscribe to players who act in a RNS type of. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're not far off from what you're saying because Jimmy kind of highlighted that in the podcast with, with J.J. Reddick. Yeah. Well, the J.J. Reddick situation was a lot different because, like, Tobias Harris wanted to come back, and I like Tobias, but the, basically Elton had to – Elton Brent, from just on paper, had to decide, do we let J.J. Reddick and Jimmy walk or do we sign Tobias to a $142 million deal? And he chose Tobias over – Jimmy and JJ. You probably should have went the other way on that one. Yeah, but 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 if but here's the thing. When you look at NBA teams, when you have a coach and a general manager who are on the same page, um, when you ask the coach, what do you think about this and this roster moves, and then the coach tells you ask the GM. And then when you ask the GM and the GM tells you ask the coach, they're okay. on the same page. Yeah. So Jimmy or not, if Brett is not wasn't getting along with him, 
the general manager is going to go with the recommendation of the coach. And it could be argued that the Heat was the team that Jimmy really wanted to play for. It was between the Rockets and the Heat before the Minnesota Timberwolves trade. So there you are. You know, so when I look at when I look at just that situation with Elton, I think Elton did a great job considering the circumstances. His first big move that he made in that general manager role was bringing in Jimmy Butler. Yeah. Kudos to him for that. But I think that the Al Horford situation, it got difficult. Um, and, and, I, and, and I think during the season, you saw where they missed J.J. Reddick. Um, I, I think, you know, you look at uh, Furkan Kormax, Fur, Furkan Kormax, who was on that roster. Um, you know, I like Matisse Thibault. I think he's going to be a great defender in this league for a long time. Um, but just, I think I'm excited for the Sixers team this coming season. I like the addition of Seth Curry. Uh, I, I like the addition of Danny Green um, as well. I think that Danny Green, you know, moving as much as, as, as much trash as he gets or as much as he's trashed, um, one of the things that I hold on to is when you look at a guy like Danny Green, I think this past season moving off of catch and shoots, he, he shoots 36% from downtown um that was some of the things that the Sixers lacked without J.J. Redick a, 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 a premium shooter mm-hmm. you have that I think they're going to continue to, to encourage him to shoot I think he's going to be comfortable around Doc Rivers um and, and, and he got a championship to show for it and I think the addition of Dwight Howard was a great move Maury had a relationship with with Dwight from his days in Houston uh Joel Embiid um and, and and Howard have a relationship and I'll add you know when you look at just the 76ers at large why Dwight chose Philly um, I can tell you that the reason why was because it was the combination of money and playing time. And the Lakers um, often closed games with Anthony Davis at the center position, and Dwight often didn't find those minutes. The only other team in the NBA, there are two teams that would fit his, his skill set. One, I'm told, uh, is, the, is the Boston Celtics, but from what I understand, uh, during Dwight's time in Charlotte, he and Kimba are not friends and they don't get along, Kimba Walker. Okay. Uh, and two, um, Golden State Warriors. And I know that Dwight was encouraged to contact the Warriors and specifically uh, Steve Kerr. I'm told he had he has some sort of semblance of a relationship with Kerr. I'm not sure if he contacted him, but I was told that he was told to contact him before um, the draft, maybe they would have went in a different direction in the draft and the Warriors would have been a place for him. And, you know, that didn't happen. So I know Joel Embiid, you know, reached out to, to, to Dwight and asked him to, you know, I think you should consider uh, Philadelphia. And, you know, here we are. But then he can't, he's not going to be on the floor with Joel Embiid at, at the same time too often. Um, Not necessarily. I, I think right. Joel Embiid's natural position is the four. I don't look at him as the center. Okay. So you think they'll, they'll do a not, lot more of Embiid at the four so that Dwight can stay on the floor? I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll use a Ralph Sampson and, and Hakeem Olajuwon type situation. Who says they can't both play? They're two different types of big men. Right. I mean, Embiid's ability to shoot from distance gives them that type of flexibility where you could play him at the four. But, I, I mean, I, I don't think that would be their primary lineup anyway. That would be lineups that you would use based on situations. Yeah, for sure. But I, I, I do think that, that that's something that they should consider tinking with at the four or five position. Or if you don't start Dwight, at least you use him at the end of games to close games. What right. do you think Scoop, Philly you... finishes the season? With this roster um, and, and, and this now coaching staff. If they're healthy, top four. You know, I think that you look at Al Horford, or excuse me, Al Horford is no longer with us. <laughs> when you look at Ben Simmons um, and you look at his, his health, you know, is that going to, you know, he's had some time to, to rest, you know. And uh, when I look at, uh, I think when you look at uh, the adding of shooters that they missed, um, I like Tobias Harris. I like um, I like a healthy Tobias Harris. I, you know, I sat with Tobias during the during the course of the season, and you know, one of the things he shared with me is we're we're only as good as we're only as good as as our health you know brings us to be, and. Yeah, you know, I, I like to buy because I think he's the vocal leader of that team. I think that the, the, the issue with Philly is you look at Simmons and you look at Joel Embiid and you think that those are the vocal leaders. Or, but I actually think I actually like Tobias in that in that role with the Sixers. And I want to see him to continue to flourish. The funny thing is, you know, both him and Danny Green are both from Long Island. 
And uh, I like that connection there with the two of them. Um, I look at, I look at, um, I look at, I look at uh, Doc Rivers. I think he, he is looking, I think he's made a lot of money during his career. He's won a championship early in his career. Um, but, you know, I think that um, the Eastern Conference is, is a lot better than people give it credit for because everybody's on the Lakers bandwagon. And, you know, you look at the Nuggets and you look at the, I mean, you even look at the Clippers. You look at, you know, just some of those teams that got better in the offseason. You look at the Golden State Warriors. The Western Conference is jam-packed. But when you look at the East, the Sixers, you know, to me are up there uh, with the Miami Heat, who so I think don't get enough credit. Uh, the Brooklyn Nets are, are surging. You know, they, they've got their healthy two stars there. You may be able to get James Harden. That'll be interesting to see. Um, but, you know, I think the Sixers are definitely a top four team in the NBA's Eastern Conference. You know, the other three teams to me in my mind are the Heat, uh, the Brooklyn Nets, um, the Milwaukee Bucks. And then, you know, I, I think I think – the Sixers are right there. I also think the Atlanta Hawks are going to be a lot better this season. Scoop, you highlighted the moves that the Sixers made and, and talked about the new head coach, Doc Rivers. He is the only head coach to ever blow three different series where he was up 3-1. And then we heard the comments from uh, Paul George, heard a snippet from when he was on All the Smoke about no adjustments being made um, in that series when they lose to Denver. How do you think his reputation has taken a hit? And ultimately, what can he do to repair that reputation at this point? I mean, I know, I know uh, you only have to be right once, and that being right was winning that championship with the, with the, with the uh, Celtics. I think he's well-respected throughout the league. Um, I think that the comments from um, Paul George were isolated comments to a bigger discussion just on him reflecting his, on his season. Um, but he said what he said, you know, and I think that um, you get mad at players for speaking their truth, but then when they, but then when they suppress it, you're mad too. You know, you have to pick a side in that regard. And I think Paul George chose to be honest. You know, with Matt Barnes and Stephen Jackson, and you know, I think ultimately it comes down to, uh, it, it comes down to just um, winning. Winning cures all. I think that's the same situation that Kyrie Irving is in in Brooklyn. You know, I think in not speaking to the media, I think sometimes when you just quiet and you just let your wins do the talking, there's nothing else to really say. Yeah. Now, because uh, you, you did bring up Kyrie, I know, you, you know, you, you've you had a, a lot of conversations with Kyrie uh, as well in the past. He's also uh, in Brooklyn with your guy, KD, uh, who we got, we got, we got the, the, the Scoop KD story on, on, the, on the YouTube channel as well. Um, I got to get your take on the, the coaching selection. And this, this, this question is actually for Eric <laughs> as well. Um, how do you think that Steve Nash is going to do with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving? And if possibly, if they do somehow manage to bring in James Harden, how do you think that, that Steve Nash will, will fare running the show? You asking me or Eric? No, I'm asking you. I'm saying this is for Eric because we every time the, the Nets make a move, I, I like to give Eric his time because he he just destroys them. <laughs> so I want to give you a chance to to to, to give no, me no, hold on, hold on, hold on. To be fair, hold on. I don't destroy them. <laughs> I I just think that a, a lot of these moves are very iffy. But Scoob, I'm a, I'm I want you to go first on it. You know, I, I want to hear what you have to say about that about the question. So your question is about Nash and yes. how he, how he'll the coach. I think when you look at I think one of the things that um, is going to help um, Nash um, is the fact that he's got his voice. You know, like, you know, if you go in a foxhole, you want people that you're familiar with uh, to, um, you want people who you're familiar with to have your back. And um, I think that you see that with uh, Amari Stoudemire, you see that with Mike D'Antoni. Um, and then, you know, on the Kevin Durant side, you see that with um, uh, who they brought in from uh, the Knicks, um, the assistant coach. Uh, da, 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 da. It, it crossed my. It, 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 no, uh, Royce. Uh, Roy Ivy. Roy Ivy. I said Roy. Roy Ivy. Yeah. 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 Who's a good, who's a good friend of Kevin Durant? Yet. Um, but yes, Royal Ivy. I think you see that. You know, Royal Ivy and, and, and Kevin are, are very close. Uh, Kevin is Kevin is the godfather of um, Royal's da daughter. And so, you know, when you look at that situation there, 
Um, and then you bring back Jacques Vaughn. So I, I, I think, you know, who, who was the interim head coach and, you know, Kitty Atkinson was fired. So, you know, I, I look at that situation with Brooklyn. I think there's a lot of familiar faces and pieces. I think, you know, for Nash, it's going to be a comfortable situation. But I also think that hiring of Nash didn't really have a lot to do with race, like everybody said. I think it had to do with relationships. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that I've been around the league for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm old and young enough to remember sitting in a, in a, a, a visitor's locker room at the Meadowlands in New Jersey uh, with, with Jason Kidd, Kevin Johnson, Steve Nash, Danny Manning, Rex Chapman, and Sean Marks. Those guys were Phoenix Suns teammates back then. Mm-hmm. And so relationship basketball is a relationship business. And, um, you know, I think Nash was hired based upon um, his, his, his experience and the fact that he has a relationship with Kevin, be dating back to being a consultant with the Golden State Warriors. And also, you know, um, Kyrie Irving has played in uh, Steve Nash's kickball uh, game, uh, games that he would have in the summertime. I actually, you know, spent some time with Kai after playing that. And, um, you know, he, he's always marveled and spoken highly of uh, Nash, and uh, this was years ago, but to see that kind of, you know, that that omen, if you will, to see him now as his head coach, I think it's a good situation. I also just think um, point guards uh, make good head coaches. You know, I, I reported recently that, you know, um, Rajon Rondo has the aspirations of you know, being an NBA head coach after he plays, and, you know, Houston is the perfect springboard for that. Or, excuse me, Atlanta, Atlanta is the ultimate springboard for that because, you um, he kind of replaces Vince Carter as a, as a veteran in residence in, in Atlanta, you know, and so except he still has a lot of le- a lot left in the tank and he's a point guard and he'll come off the bench and mention Trey Young the same way that Sam Cassell did uh, for Rondo in Boston. And so when I look at there's all of those different pieces with Dash, I do think that point guards make better, uh, head co- make good head coaches. I won't say better, make good head coaches because Paul Silas was a head coach or and was a center. Um, so, you know, when I, when I look at um, just what Nash brings to the table. I think Nash has always just been somebody that's been respected. And, you know, we're just talking to different people around the league. Uh, I, I spoke to his agent uh, a few months ago. Uh, one of the things that, you know, he's talked to me about is how much Nash is so unselfish. Like he'll, he'll want other people to, to um, get certain deals and won't even take the percentage off of it because he just wants to see people win. And I, I, it takes me back to that that old that old that saying, you know, the man who works so hard, works very hard, will be paid as the person, or man or woman will be paid as the person who works hard. So, I think he's being rewarded by becoming the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets, and you know, I, I think he has the support of his, of his of his players, the front office, and you know, hopefully the fans buy in as well. So, do you feel like um, Kyrie's comments? Um, put unnecessary pressure on Nash. You know, I know him and KD in the podcast, and he, he may have he may have just been speaking freely amongst his friend, and you know, it it took on a life of his own where he makes a comment of, you know, we really don't need head, a head coach. And then Nash also being an inexperienced first time head coach with an assistant coach who has a lot of years under his belt. Do you feel those comments alone have, have now created unnecessary pressure on Nash? I feel like I have, be- as a member of the media. Um, I have become the unofficial Kyrie interpreter. Well, that's why I've got to ask you. The, the Kyrie whisperer. I, I, yeah, I've got. That's why I've got to ask you. Listen, you know Kyrie much better than we know Kyrie, so I've got to come to you directly. I think that no, and and, and I said that for a reason because I think that when Kyrie speaks, you get mad, and then when he doesn't speak, you get mad too. Not you, people. They get mad, and I think that. I think. So I have um, I have friends uh, having split time between Manhattan, Bronx, Jersey. There are there are different in my mind. There are different borough dialects, um, and I feel like Brooklyn speaks differently than Bronx. Manhattan speaks differently than Staten Island. That's a fact. And I think and I think sometimes and Queens speaks their own language. But I think sometimes when somebody family and friends that I have in the Bronx, I go there, I'll say, there goes that Bronx. And they'll be like, what are you talking about? I said, it's the tone that you don't hear. It's the tone that you don't, you don't, 
that you that that's missing. And I and I think sometimes with Kyrie when he speaks, he doesn't always realize that the way he speaks, everybody else doesn't speak, and there's a tone that he assumes that people hear, and or he doesn't care. And I think. Um, him being honorary Bronx by way of his father growing up in the Mitchell houses, maybe that's the Bronx I speak of. But I, I, I think when he says things to him, he, he means it from a good place, but everybody is going based off of the verbiage, not what's inferred. Yeah. And I think he's just in, a, in an interesting situation where when he speaks, um, people listen. When he doesn't speak, people listen to. And I think when, and I just think that that's just where it is. And again, that's why I think winning kind of, if winning can allow people, certain people to forget about Tom Brady's deflate gate blunder, Kyrie, who from all accounts has followed the rules, winning a championship for Brooklyn will pe- make people forget in the same vein too. Do, do, do you think, uh, if they stay healthy, the Nets make it to the NBA Finals. I think they have the opportunity. I think it all depends on Kyrie, his health, what's up with KD and his Achilles. Because I think, you know, practice videos aren't game videos. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I think ultimately, I think Karis LeVert is in a good situation, having played a long time without those guys before they arrive, playing in the bubble with Kyrie and KD being out. Now you got to mesh that all together. It's going to be a joy to see. It's going to be a treat to see. And and I'm excited. We've waited over a year for this to happen, and hopefully it all works out. Uh, Kyrie on Media Day released a statement as opposed to speaking directly to the media. Um, Do should we expect that the rest of the season? And is that a byproduct of, as you mentioned, the media overreacting to every statement or comment he makes? No, I think this was an isolated incident. Um, And I'm told you know, that, that that's what that was. Um, when you're an NBA player, you're required to speak uh, to um, the media. Um, and, you know, that was kind of, I think there's a disconnect between, you know, the day-to-day media members that cover the Nets um, and Kyrie. Um, I know that to be true um, firsthand uh, in December of last year uh, when I reported the shoulder injury that Kai had. And I was getting calls from people um, who basically said like they were complaining to the league office about Kyrie's not speaking to the media. You know, when you're hurt, you're required by NBA rules to speak to the media at least once a week. And this was around Christmas time because I was on your show, I think the week before. And I remember like there was just this period where a lot of media members just don't, um, don't, they want to do their job and they want to cover Kyrie. And I get a lot of calls just about different things relate, relating to that. And I think that ultimately um, every player is different in how they establish their relationship with, with their respective star player. The only thing I can kind of honestly compare it to um, is uh, LeBron's first year um, in Los Angeles and I was getting calls from, from LA writers uh, who was saying to me, like, you know, like they feel like they're not that far removed from Kobe and Kobe was the late, was a Laker, was the face of the Lakers. And, you know, Lonzo Ball is not Kobe and no disrespect to him. That's just where he was in his career. But, you know, you know, Magic was a, was a great Laker. Shaq was a great Laker and they all had some sort of rapport relationship with, LeBron and then you and and a connection to the city. And I think one thing that I learned about that was, you know, because of the Los Angeles area's huge Mexican population, one of the reasons why a lot of people in that community connected with Kobe was because he was married to a Mexican woman in Vanessa Bryant. And so LA really took a liking to him because he was a man of the people. His wife was Mexican um, and he liked people. He took time with people. And so with LeBron, they were looking for that sort of semblance in the same vein. And it took an adjustment because this was the first major, 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 like no disrespect to Miami at all, but Los Angeles is more comparable to New York than Miami is. And so there was this this disconnect with LeBron in year one, but in year two, they won a championship. And 
Also, every place that LeBron has been, he's always had his guys, certain guys that just were already there. You look at the Dave McMenamins, respectfully. You look at the Brian Windhorses, respectfully. L.A. Is, was different. McMenamin found his way to Los Angeles, and you know LeBron has his guys. But ultimately, I, I think it comes down to comfortability. The other thing with specifically Kyrie is this. He has a distrust with media, and that's dated back to his days with Cleveland. Um, and, and so – Boston, it kind of was like he didn't want to be there. He was traded there, and there was a disconnect with the fans, and, you know, he was hurt. And then so now you come to a situation in Brooklyn. Number one, you're playing for the hometown team or for the team that played in your home state when you were a kid. Number two, this is your media market, being a native of West Orange, New Jersey. And I just think that, you know, LeBron has – or, excuse me, Michael Jordan had his Ahmad Rashad um, – LeBron has his Dave McMenamin, and, you know, I think Kyrie has to establish um, his level of comfortability with certain members of the media if he's interested, you know, and how to get that message out. You might have to reach out to Kyrie and let real, real talk be, be that for him. Nah, I was about to say, so Scoop, so you, you basically saying you're the Ahmad Rashad to Kyrie. That's, that's what's happening right now. That's what we see developing. Yeah. Is that what you think? <laughs> <laughs> It's not a bad thing if that if that's what it is. Right. It, it, it's 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 nothing negative about it. it. You you may be you may be that direct contact to them and, and the person they trust the most. Um now uh, we talked about the trade obviously earlier this week. There's another big story that developed this week. The NBA will not be testing for marijuana this season. However, there are other stipulations that have been put in place uh in regards to what the players can do in their free time. So it's two part question, Scoop. First do you see the non-testing for marijuana being a long-term thing within the league? And secondly, James Harden's activities being in a strip club after the restrictions had already been released. Is that his way of saying, get me the hell out of here? Yeah, first question about Harden, I don't know. Um, I think, and I don't want to speculate, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for him. Um, but I do think that just with COVID and everything that's going on, you just got to be so careful. Um, um, marijuana is kind of, um, I mean, they've been doing it and they just now are openly not testing them for it. And so I think that's the truth there. You know, if you can't be recreational in the street, you can be recreational in your home. Um, so I, 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 as far as your question about the future, um, I know the, some weathermen or women get in trouble for predicting the forecast, so I, I don't, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to misspeak, but I, I do think that um, it's something that they should, they should consider. I, I think for as much as players, look, two things: one, as much as players are already doing it and not getting caught, or they know when their testing day is, they should. Number two, if they decide that they're not going to test anymore, I think that the NBA, from a players' association or retired players' association perspective, should retroactively refund all of the players who got fined for marijuana use. I don't think that, that, that's gonna happen at this point. They got the money now. I don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna go backwards. They may may stop the fines moving forward, but I don't I don't know about uh, about going backwards. Um, you, you brought up Lonzo uh, a little while ago. How big is it that uh, Leangelo was signed by the Pistons, and now all three of the Ball brothers are in the NBA right now? I think it's great. I think it's great for basketball. The NBA is all about storylines. You know, the NBA, I've, t I've said to people for a few years now, is the new WWE. Um, they are legitimately, um, as much as it's about basketball, it's about people on the mic and people speaking their mind and the sound bites. And so, you know, I, I look at it in that way. I think, you know, um, people have said that they're the Kardashians of the NBA. I, I would say if we're keeping it WWE, they are the McMahons of the NBA minus the ownership of the brand of the NBA, but they own their own brand. And they did it oh, by man. selling controversy boys and being entrepreneurs and taking taking onus of their brand. So I think it's great money-wise. I think it's great storyline. But you also got to remember the LiAngelo Ball contract is not a guaranteed contract. Um, and I I joke when I say this, but maybe that was the contract that Jay Cole should have took with the Pistons. Um, and, you know, LiAngelo got it instead. 
Maybe, but you know, he didn't want to. He didn't want to go to a losing uh, situation, I guess. So he left it, let it uh, go for Leangelo. Tell you guys something. I'm annoyed though, cause have you guys seen the sneakers that the the the, the uh, J Cole sneakers that dropped on Friday? Pumas. Pumas. He got a new. He got a new pair that just dropped. Already, look he at that. With his life flex. Every time, no, school, like, you come on the show, you can't be flexing like this, okay? <laughs> You got some, listen, he, he definitely got some joints. Yeah, he, and, and I will say this, his sneakers is better than several NBA players. Oh, that's a fact. Uh, that I'm not even going to do it to them and say all the names of the cats that got wax sneakers because we, we had a show dedicated to that. So I'm going <laughs> to for the day, but there's a couple of cats, a couple of superstars out there that got some horrible looking sneakers. So we're going we to we let them rock for, for, this, uh, for this one. Um, I do want to talk a little bit of boxing with you because you recently had to sit down with uh with with, with, with Big Baby. Um, two year suspension from boxing. We've been hard on on, on Big Baby in the past, um, but just just talk to me about mentally where he's at and in, in, in dealing with the with the suspension. I mean, he accepts the suspension. Uh, I spoke to him on the phone uh, a few days ago. Um, he, there were a lot of things going on behind the scenes with his lawyer, as well as him, just about an appeal process. And, and ultimately, he may not have to do the whole two years. You know, there's a, there's a way that he can do potentially six months of, the, of those, two, of those uh, 24 months. And, um, you know, I know that Jarrell wants that very badly to get back into the ring. Um, he wants to fight, but he realizes that, you know, that's a process that has to take place. But also, um, he has expressed that what he was tested for, um, those chemicals didn't read right. And so part of his appeal process is actually kind of just a breakdown of what it was that he actually took. Um, and so, you know, we're waiting for that. That's, that's, that's what he expressed to me when we spoke a few days ago. Did he speak about, I guess, missed opportunities? Did you guys... About not, you know, the, the, the talk about that at all. So this is what happened. I'll I share this with you. Um, he was actually supposed to come on my show um, Thursday. And that was booked like a month in advance. The news came out Wednesday. So we were trying to figure out just, you know, no slight on him at all. Like whether he should speak or just release a statement. And, I, and, and we just came to a consensus. Just give me a statement. We'll figure it out later. Um, so we kept it very brief. Um, he was honest with me, but we didn't, honestly, we did not speak about, um, you know, the specifics as it relates to fighting and missed opportunity. Um, he just, you know, he said he wants the process to take its course. Um, you know, I wrote it in my column over at heavy.com where I'm a senior writer. Um, and, you know, he, he released a statement. I'm, I'm looking for it now on my phone as I'm talking to you. Um, but yeah, I posted we're, we're, we're hard on him, but I think it's, for me, it's more so, so it's a Brooklyn thing because I would like for him to do better. Anybody that's coming out of the city, but especially personally for me, coming out of Brooklyn, I want you to win. You know what I'm saying? We got a tail tail Fimo who's holding it down for Brooklyn right now in, in the sport of boxing. So I want that. I want everybody from the city to to, to really go out there and put on. Um, you know, so I really do hope that he can take this time off and use it as a tool to 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 to, to refuel himself and come back bigger and better than ever. Because you can't, you know, you get a shot at the at the at the world heavyweight championship. That's something that you know may not come back around. So I really hope that he can get it together. Did he at any point when you guys spoke? Um, did he talk about where he sees his current standing within the heavyweight division? Um, and also, as Trip mentioned. You know, and, and you talked about it as well as, as far as opportunities, you know, he tests positive, he misses the fight with Joshua, which leads to Andy Ruiz major upset. Did he discuss either one of those two things when you guys spoke? We literally talked on the phone for about minute, 32 minutes. Uh, we talked about the pros and cons of the show, uh, doing it that day. Um, we talked about some things with his family that I'll keep that in between us, but but ultimately as it relates to like fighting, boxing, it was pretty much just about, um, you know, disappointed and you know hoping to get back in the ring um because he loves the sport of boxing and um really just getting to the root getting to the root of the matter as it relates to what those substances were that he was being tested for and 
hoping to, you know, honestly come to a resolution. But what you asked definitely um, is what it wasn't that long enough of a conversation. And I think for me, it's definitely like a middle ground because, like you said, Trip, you know, I, I want to see him do well. You know, Brooklyn is my adopted borough. I, I, Brooklyn, Brooklyn was like a field trip for me growing up. You know, Brooklyn and Queens. I was between you know Manhattan, Brooklyn, Westchester, and Jersey growing up. But you know, once a year, Queens and Brooklyn it was like driving to Virginia. Um, but you know, ultimately, you know, when when I look at just Big Baby and what he represents, I think um, you know I think a lot of people want to see him do well. You know, and I think that you know missing that fight against Joshua and, and Masters Square Garden. Could you imagine like if he, if he had won that fight, man? If he shocked the world, like oh man, we would have been talking about a different bag. Yeah. That you know, so definitely hope he gets he gets everything together. Um, really quick, because we running a little bit low on time, I just want to uh, quickly shout out the sponsors: uh, Kmart, Petro Home Services, Soundview Liquors, and uh, the Rosado Farm. Thank you guys for rocking out with us, and make sure you guys are following us on all all our social media: Facebook.com forward slash Real Fans Real Talk, Twitter, Instagram at Real Fans Talk. Um, website is realfansrealtalk.com. If you are not in New York City and you can't watch the show on Thursday nights uh, via v- Verizon, you can just click the link on the website and you can watch um, every Thursday from 8 to 9 p.m. And uh, subscribe to that YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash for the fans productions. Um, also, make sure you guys are, are, are keeping up to date with, with Scoop be on, on all his social media as well as uh, heavy.com. Um, just Scoop, just let them know really quick uh, if you got anything else that's coming up. No, I mean, nothing coming up, man. Honestly. Um, he say that right now. And then next thing I know, I go on Instagram. Oh, yeah, Scoop B sits down with MJ. Come on, Scoop. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this stuff. Uh, honestly, um, I'm just closing the year, brother. I'm closing the year. I'm focused on um, just getting out good content. Um, working, working, writing, and I just, you know, Sunday I dropped a couple of things. I spoke with briefly with stuff on Marbury Brooklyn's on the other day, just about the Kyrie Irving situation. Can you do me a favor when next time y'all have a conversation, can you tell him ease up on hold, please? Say that again? Ease up on hold, like chill. Like he got to chill with that. Please just text him now and tell him. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, and I rock with Steph too. That's Brooklyn. So I don't like seeing Brooklyn versus Brooklyn going at it. I know, you know, Ho said some things in the song, but it was years ago. Like, come on, can we let that go? We, we just had had Gucci Mane versus Jeezy. You feel me? Like, come on, come on, Steph. We got to let that go, brother. Yeah, he, um, that, that, that thing I think definitely bothered him, but you know, he answered it from a perspective of, you know, I asked him his opinion. If I asked Steph something, he's going to answer it. And yeah, yeah. One of the things I value about our relationship. Um, and congrats to Steph on everything he's been able to accomplish in China. I, I mean, you, you, multiple statues, you can't, <laughs> like, what can you say to that? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's putting on for the city for real. So I just want to, you know, let them let it be known. Like, I, you know, I got a lot of love for Steph. That's Brooklyn. I used to put him on all my teams in NBA Live, you know, back in the day. So it's definitely a lot of love for Steph. But, you know, I just want to, if we can get that thing squashed out and let, let them old feelings go, man. It's Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's how we do, man. Spread love. No, man, I, I think, I think, um, you know, Earl, I had Earl Watson, uh, former NBA player, NBA player, uh, former Suns coach, UCLA legend on the Heavy Live with Scoopy show uh, recently. Uh, we talked about Rich Paul. Uh, we talked about Eric Bledsoe. Had Kenny Anderson on a couple of weeks ago, right before Thanksgiving. Uh, Heavy Live with Scoopy, we've been running since August through heavy.com. We've had anybody from Jeff Van Gundy to, um, Carl Banks to uh, gospel recording artist Kirk Franklin to porn star Lisa Ann to Jay Williams. Like we've had yeah. a lot of different people. Put that out there just like that. It's cool. You can't what just you, you can't try to graze over that one right there. You can go one? go back two people. Okay, Lisa Ann, Kirk Franklin. No, see now you're doing too much. Don't, don't come up. <laughs> Let's just stick to the Lisa Ann. Let's talk, can we before Kirk Franklin? <laughs> we got two minutes. Talk to me about that one and how that came about really quick. Lisa? Yeah. I like the song. I like love. Shout out to Kirk Franklin and everything he does. But I think the people at home want to know more about how that Lisa uh, interview came about. I mean, I've known Lisa for about four years. Um, I, had a, I reached out to her. I was like, hey, you trying to do the show? She was like, yeah. And we just literally just made it happen. Like, she's a good resource, particularly because she transitioned into sports. Uh, she does Sirius XM radio and, you know, I really was just interested in that. It wasn't really any sexual innuendos. Like she's just, she's a good person to know. Um, 
and I and I and I like her vibe, you know. So yeah, that that that's how that came about. I just asked her, reached out to and asked her. Okay, okay. Trip Trip was hoping for a juicier story, I thought, yeah, I thought or, it was or a juicier backstory to come along with that. That's why that's why he hit you with the oh, okay. Yeah, right, yeah, right. that'll be on on uh, Love and Sports New York. <laughs> that's the new reality know. show. <laughs> Man, man, I, I don't, I, I don't really like that reality scene. That means people got to know too much about my life, my personal life. None of your business. No, I, no, I like the space that I'm in. Um, but I, you know, Lisa's like, like I said, Lisa's cool people. Um, it's good when you, you, you can reach out to people and and book them and people that you really are interested. Like to me, like to go back to Kirk Franklin, my favorite gospel recording artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I asked him about Kanye West's Sunday Service and his thoughts on it as a gospel recording artist, like. Things like that, I've, 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 I'm really interested. Antoine Walker was one of my favorite NBA players to t- just to talk about, you know, his relationship with Kenny Martin during the NBA playoffs that year, where the Celtics and the Nets were going at it, or Paul Pierce and his relationship. And go back to the Kentucky days, like that's what I really like about you know the, the platform that I have with Heavy Live with Scoop B, and um, you know, it's a good it's a good spot to be in. Oh, really quick, one 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 more thing, we got to get to this while we got you here, Scoop. What's up? I, I, but now I know you saw the Nate Robinson knockout. Uh, the whole Jake Paul that we're not gonna go into it again because we already got that we already you know did the whole roaster session and all that got out our system but now um you know since then Le'Veon Bell called him out um you know Le'Veon Bell for NFL for um playing for the Chiefs now and Evander Kane uh from the NHL has called him out but Floyd Mayweather jumped the line and well, I think he wanted some get back for the brothers well and- hold on I didn't mean to cut you off Floyd is fighting his older brother Logan okay Floyd's fighting, fighting yes. old. Okay. All right. So, well, first of all, what do you think about that that whole Mayweather uh, fight now? Like coming in to do this exhibition, do you think, like, what, just just talk to me about it, man? What's your thoughts on on the whole Floyd getting into this exhibition fight game? I think I think Floyd Mayweather is an equal opportunist. I mean, but I think this was planned even before it was announced. Like, like for example, the Nate Robinson Jake Paul on the card, like they announced it like like on a Thursday or a Friday and I had gotten a call like the week prior and it was something that was in the works in a while as it related to, 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 um, Tyson and, and, um, and, Ray um, yeah, Ray Jones. So I knew he was on the underguard. And so that's not just something out the blue. Somebody just said, I'm gonna fight him today. That's something that that's, that's been, that's yeah. been under wraps and the rollout happened the way it was supposed to happen. So, um, as it relates to what you said about jumping out, no, I just think that's a that's a natural progression. I think mean, you know, I think that box, bo- bo- I think boxing is taking the big three route as it relates to boxing. Okay. For these old timers, it so could I, actually could be a, a boost to, to, to boxing because you know the 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 thing with boxing is oh, boxing is a dying sport, so this may actually help seeing these legends kind of come back and, and and go at each other. And uh, shout out to Snoop too, because Snoop actually got to deal with uh with, with Trilla, so he's actually gonna have the Fight Club boxing league. So I'm actually looking forward to uh to see who is going to fight uh un- under that uh, umbrella. Trilla is doing some big things. I actually met with Trilla during All Star Weekend um in Chicago, and they are got a they got a lot of things that they're gonna be rolling out. And you know he's one of Snoop is one of the shareholders. As, as a few other people um, that are that are celebrities in the same way that kind of Jay Z and, and and his friends were doing with um, Title, you know, like it, the same type of concept with Triller. Okay. All right, man. Your school, man. You know, we appreciate you as always, my brother, uh, for pulling up to us. Um, just, you know, we 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 gonna we gonna we gonna bring you back back soon soon enough, man, because you know uh, the NBA season is is fast approaching. Uh, you know, so they did drop, drop the NBA schedule a couple of days ago. So we definitely gonna try to have you back one more time, at least before the year is out. Uh, but for myself, Trip Young, Legend in Two Games, Eric Sanchez, and Scoop B, Scoop B Radio, we up out of here. Peace. We appreciate you, Scoop. Likewise, my man. Both of you. Live from the camp. Uh huh.